Hey everyone, today I'm joined with a special guest, Harry Merle, and today we are going to be discussing his second book, and I will leave a link down below to the new book from Harry Merle, and it's a book on cognitive personality theory, how you can develop the cognitive functions, how you can develop cognitive flexibility, uh, how you can uh, learn to have a more uh, fluid understanding of the cognitive functions, and how you can learn to access all eight of the cognitive functions. So some of the biggest changes that he's making is he's moving from an eight function hierarchy uh, to a cognitive function map, and he is uh, trying to connect and study subtypes and unique variations and how we can really develop and uh, individuate and uh, complete or uh, move forward in the hero's journey. So thank you so much for joining in, um, and I uh, hope you're going to enjoy the discussion as much as we do. I'll say I got it yesterday and I couldn't put my <laughs> eyes down. <laughs> like I had already read for eight hours that day. I'd spent the whole day reading. And then I got the book and I was like, God damn it, I just have to keep going. You know, like around nine, 10 o'clock, I was like getting really red eyed, you know, from kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, reading way too much. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, amazing. And uh, what I see that I really like with uh, your book and with your model, uh, and I must say, this is, uh, your model is uh, the other model second to mine that I really connect with and resonate with the most and always have felt a strong uh, uh, connection to. And the reason why is because uh, you're moving away from uh, behavioralism and uh, you're moving towards uh, a more fluid definition of the cognitive functions. And I think that's very, yeah. very much needed uh, because I think people are looking for, you know, that one size fits definition that will, you know, cover an entire scope of your personality like mm -hmm. uh but what actually happens you know yeah you're trying to simplify something that is actually really complicated you know the human yeah. mind uh, cognitive functions yeah. they all intersect to some degree and that's exactly. also something you're showing as well that uh there is a there is a space kind of where intuition and sensing kind of blends together and uh yeah. so I thought I'd um, uh, begin by asking you, like, why did you decide to uh, uh, write and make the second edition to the book and what is your goal with it so far? Cool. Well, first of all, thanks so much for the kind words. It's been really cool to uh, hear that you enjoyed the second edition. Um, so my main goal was kind of like, um, first of all, something that had always been kind of niggling at me was like, I guess it's like the small potatoes, but it's like certain parts of the terminology and stuff weren't fully updated. I can't even, like, um, I used to refer to, for example, the CPT attitudes, CPT divergence and uh, convergence under kind of like a different name. So it's like, you know, there were just various instances of sort of like terminology and stuff being inconsistent within the book. And it's made my TI go wild. <laughs> um, so it was like things like that. But it was also more than anything, like, because I've been releasing so much updated um, parts of the system over YouTube and the CPT Explained series, such as like dip functions, the more fluid elements and, you know, more elaboration over like what the continuums are and how like, you know, kind of functions blur together and blend together via the networks of the mind in the actual, you know, the videos on my channel, I realized, well, it doesn't really feel right that I've got a book called Cognitive Personality Theory and it doesn't actually go into the true parts of Cognitive Personality Theory. It's almost like kind of like, Originally, it was kind of just a sort of how did I get to this from the words of Carl Jung and how did it lead to a fluid model, for example, which is very important. But it's just having kind of like a book out there that had certain very fundamental parts of the system missing or at least not explained in full detail just didn't sit with me. So it's like, you know, I was like early last year, full steam ahead with like book number two. You know, I wanted to get deeper and deeper, I want to get more complicated, I want to throw in all of the new stuff I've been working on behind the scenes. And yeah. it actually took some effort of will to say, no, <laughs> wait a minute, we've got something unfinished here, we've got something that's kind of like sitting there. Yeah, because um, you kind of uh, vanished from the yeah. face of the earth for a while there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I totally <laughs> like uh, you had like this totally uh, massively like in increasing YouTube channel, like yeah. everything was going up, you know, like at an inc yeah. uh, incredible pace, like you did yeah. some amazing videos. And then it just kind of vanished. And I figured, okay, yeah. he must be up to something really special. Like he must be <laughs> yeah. like really like going into like the uh, deepest aspects of NI and TI, you know, like <laughs> exactly. pulling inside yeah. of his own head. Totally, totally. It's such an introverted year for me. I mean, like, you know, in um, 
in 2020, I was in full kind of like extroverted thinking dip. I was just like output, output, output mm -hmm. and system, system, system. And it was like, it was going really well. And I'm glad I put so much effort into getting the channel, you know, going in a way that it did. But then I just had to take my foot off the accelerator, not just for the sake of kind of like um, my own mental well-being, although that was important, I did have a bit of a burnout, but also just because I felt like if I kept, you know, like pushing forward with the content, the important kind of like aspects I need to do behind the scenes, the additional research I wanted to do, for example, the kind of like the reframing I needed to do in order to say, wait a minute, is this on course? Is this where I need to go with this? What else is unfinished at the moment, such as the ebook, that I need to go back to before I'm ready to move any further forward? Because yeah. otherwise I may never have gotten to the stuff that I needed to get to last year. So as you say, like your assumptions totally right, dude. It's like there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on. And yeah. it's like, it started like with the writing book number two and that's still like, I've still got all the stuff I've done on that so far that I'm gonna finally be in a position to go back to, which is exciting to me. But there's also kind of like the second edition of the ebook. And there's also kind of like a lot of theoretical reframing. Like, even though like um, I wasn't putting out much content last year, like I was doing a lot of client work. I also launched a kind of a type coaching service as well, which has also been doing pretty well. And it's like, that was just data, 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 data. And all of this data was like, oh, that's interesting. So maybe there were certain parts of the theory that kind of like need to be expanded upon. You know, there are certain cognitive functions that sort of like in certain cognitive types that still seem to be, you know, requiring of greater kind of like um, expansion in my understanding of their respective fluidity. And it's like, they have actually made like additional kind of like theoretical developments within CPT itself last year as well, especially like all oh, the live streams I do with the Patreon as well. Like I was doing that consistently every month. So it's like a lot of them um, on the surface level, there was not very much going on, but then like behind the scenes and inside the scenes, such as on Patreon, there was a lot going on, but it was, um, it was unfortunate that I had to take the step back that I did, but I ultimately, I wanted to make sure I was on as solid a footing as I possibly could be before the channel grew anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's uh, the right call to always trust yourself and to dedicate yourself to, you know, where, where your inner voice tells you you need to go. So the thing I was really wondering about, and it's like, what, what are you hoping that your readers are going to take away from this book? Like, what do you want them to feel at the end of it? Like, what do you want them to do? How do, you, do, do they, Should they start developing their cognitive functions? Are you hoping for them to shift how they think about the world or themselves? Like, what's your ambition here? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I love it. And um, I guess um, the ultimate one is, and I guess this is the main reason, or at least one of the main reasons I revisited the uh, book in order to create a second edition was to sort of like to put even further emphasis upon the fluid element. Like I, you know, as you know, Eric, I added an entire new chapter on kind of the fluidity at the end of the book. Um, because I just wanted to make sure that at the end of the read, the ultimate takeaway was not kind of like people could be divided into 16 types. So it's not like this is this function. Therefore, when I do this, I'm using this function and it's all great. But much more than that, it was kind of like, OK, I probably fit somewhere within this type spectrum. And within this type spectrum, I just because I find myself, I chart myself within a type, for example, it doesn't mean I suddenly have to start operating to this framework of this is what you're supposed to do because you're this type, this is the person you're supposed to be. And you're not allowed to do these things because they're bad functions and these are your good functions, all of that kind of stuff. I was like, no, no, I'll just loosen up a little bit. Like, okay, yes, there are cognitive tendencies or cognitive predispositions, but it doesn't mean you're beholden to these predispositions. You know, this is just a map. And that's why I like I, Again, like I actually went through the entire book and changed every instance of cognitive stack to cognitive map because it's like a, a treasure map in many ways. It's a treasure map towards individuation and it's a treasure map to kind of like freeing ourselves of these constraints. And you know, it's not about kind of like, like trying to like transcend into kind of like this like godlike being or anything like that. You know, there's a lot of acceptance that comes of kind of saying, yeah, this is my default resting state and I'm not ashamed of that. I'm like, I like being an INFJ, for example, it's nice. Um, but in no way am I going to have that tell me that I can't do certain functions. Like if it wasn't for my extrovert thinking, I wouldn't be here in the first place, you know? <laughs> so it's like, um, it's just about kind of like, yeah, recognizing this type stuff. Yeah, this seems to actually be legit. This seems to actually be, you know, a way of categorizing individual differences in a reliable way. But, you know, use it with a growth mindset. Use it in a kind of a way that frees you rather than inhibits you. And never feel like you have to act a certain way in order to kind of, justify you being a certain thing or justify you being in a certain role. You can act however you 
want to, you know, just be a nice, fluid human being. That's kind of the emphasis, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it's like something I see throughout your book is that you will say, mm. like, for example, a person that goes into the inferior and lets the inferior dominate mm. can mm. become a bit more turbulent, which is also what I've been saying all along. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't exactly have to be. It doesn't have to mm. be. That's what you always say. Like, it can also mm. yeah. be. And then you show that there's nuances to these things and, you know, that uh, exactly. you can learn to develop in the right way. So I was wondering, you know, uh, what does a cognitive superhuman or cognitive ubermensch look like? You know, is there such a person, you know, that has, uh, uh, do they have all eight functions or what happens to you know, such a person? You know what? I'm actually, uh, this is a bit of a devil's advocate thing. I'm testing out at the moment and it's definitely not my firm belief, but I'm increasingly beginning to suspect that this kind of cognitive superhuman might actually be your everyday person. You know, every you've got to know at least a few people in your life who don't quite seem to fit within a type, you know, they seem like, okay, yeah, they seem to have these preferences, but I'm not really seeing an inferior, I'm not really seeing a kind of blind spot, like, you know, like, I'm not saying that these people are kind of like, uh, they are superhumans, or they're doing all of these amazing things, but they seem to be remarkably adaptable and fluid, and I just can't help suspecting, and again, this is just a kind of hypothesis, that when we enter this type spectrum, more people who are more willing, or more likely to enter this type kind of sphere, this community of typology, are actually going to be outside the norm. They are going to be more rigid. They aren't actually going to be as fluid as an everyday person. And, you know, of course, we have, we all know, like, the stereotypical ESTJ in our lives. We all know the stereotypical kind of, like, um, ISTJ in our lives and stuff. And, yeah, okay, certain people are really rigid within the type. But I, I do know, like, more than a few people who are kind of just fluid, who don't seem to demonstrate particular preferences. And yet pe when people come into the typing service, example, it's like, oh, well, you're this, you're this, you're this, you know? So it's just, that's one kind of like um, slightly controversial viewpoint I'm entertaining at the moment. But in terms of kind of like maybe someone who is really like actively developing the type, you know, really actively sort of saying, yeah, okay, this is my type. And I'm pushing through all of these functions. I'm activating all of these gateways, I'm, you know, activating my dip functions all over the place, my attitudes are completely fluid, all of these things. I mean, I don't think in any way, shape or form, this makes for someone of kind of um, superior intellect or incredible creativity or just like, you know, innovating left, right and center or anything like that. I think it just more than anything makes for someone who relative to their own human agenda can adapt and overcome any kind of obstacle that comes their way. and adapt to circumstances that necess don't necessarily go their way in a kind of a really healthy and positive way and they just don't really have blind spots per se they can reflect upon the information that is available to them and then take the information in without any kind of cognitive biases getting away for example so i think more than anything that's what individuation means to me it's not necessarily about kind of activating a superhuman brain or anything like that it's always going to be relative to your own agenda as a person not everybody wants to be a kind of a superhuman philanthropist millionaire or anything like that and it'll also be relative to the information that you are surrounded with and you know is going to come your way so yeah if you have limitless information maybe with an individuated mind you could become some kind of superhuman but ultimately i don't think people want all of that information so <laughs> Yeah, that's it, because at the, you're kind of wrapping up your book by discussing cognitive fluidity, and that's what I started mm -hmm. to wonder. Maybe that's the example that you're setting, that uh, for you, like a truly healthy person is somebody that has developed to have a very high cognitive fluidity in that sense mm -hmm. that they can move between and use and uh, have differentiated all cognitive functions and know how to mm -hmm. access and use them in their daily life for success. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that's just really healthy because like it'll be relative to whatever skills you want to pursue and um i mean the caveat of kind of like the individuation model if you will from a cognitive function standpoint is that you know there will be times in our lives when we are going to be using and leaning heavily on one function over another one like certain jobs do scream certain functions over other ones for example and some jobs don't require like a lot of kind of um social nuance um for example which is like an fese pairing of cpt Maybe it's a bit more F-E-N-E, uh, for example. And so it'll always be like relative to like what our surroundings are. And I guess like in some ways you can use individuation as a kind of like, a, well, maybe I need to fill out the rest of my life with certain other things that fill, you know, that activate my cognitive functions. But I think more than anything, you just need to prioritize kind of like doing what makes you feel personally fulfilled. Don't go out of your way in order to add loads of rote memorization into better sensory stuff um, to your life if you don't feel like it'll make you happy or anything like that. But generally speaking, 
again, another hypothesis I'm entertaining is, and it's something I have to type coaching as well, is that generally speaking, if you look at your day and you realize there are serious gaps of kind of function employment, chances are you could actually improve your day and make yourself more happy by adding in a little bit of those kind of functions. That's the way I like to see it. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, mm. you beyond that, uh, beyond talking about cognitive fluidity, you also talk about mm. the hero's journey. You know, mm, uh, yeah. I was listening to Joseph Campbell uh, the other day. You know, he talks about how uh, you kind of have the left hand path or the right hand path when it comes to your personal development. You know, okay. Mm. Then he says mm. that, uh, yeah, um, first you have the persona structure. You know, you can choose to stay and conform within your current society mm. and within your current role and within your current life mm -hmm. and uh, focus on your image and on approval and on fitting in and on you know doing everything society tells you what to do and you know and you can mm. choose to focus on your own personal individuation project and that's mm. you know deciding okay for yourself what is it i want to do what is it i'm passionate about what is it i need mm. to do and uh so i was wondering like what's your thoughts on uh, that and the, mm. how should we move uh, in, how should we move in the hero's journey well the thing i find most beautiful about the hero's journey is how cyclical it is like we might kind of like be embodying a societal persona from a perspective of kind of like a contribution, wanted, wanted to contribute, you know, wanting to bring all of these things that we've accumulated into society. But, you know, the beauty of it is that once we start kind of like reconciling the ego and the superego, for example, once we can, you know, start kind of like becoming self-invested and once we start perceiving ourselves as a distinct human entity, then we go through these processes, we accumulate this wisdom, we go into these battles and these fights and, you know, we accrue all of these additional kind of experiences and we unlock various areas of our brain and become more individuated, for example. But the beautiful thing is, it's like ultimately it allows you to integrate more into society. It's not about kind of trying to be this separate person shining like a star. It's not about this kind of like this current individualistic craze the West is going through, for example, where you buy your half. If you're not some kind of like um, highly distinct entity, if you were in any way similar to anybody else, for example, if you're not the rarest personality type, then therefore you practically don't exist. You're just a wallflower, you know, that kind of mindset. But what's beautiful about it, so if you do invest in yourself with a more healthy mindset of just saying, well, what am I truly? What truly makes me happy? And what truly do I need to work on? It's not about comparing myself to other people all the time. But once you go through that process, then you can come out into this position where you're ready to give back. You can give more, you know, and then you can integrate more. And it's not, yeah, it's not about kind of like, individuation isn't about kind of like separating oneself from the collective and being this island unto yourself. Ultimately, the process ends in reintegration. And once you're reintegrated, you're more integrated than you ever were before. That's yeah. how I like to look at it, yeah. I see it kind of similarly, like what I'm seeing yeah. is uh, definitely you do have to kind of remove yourself a little bit from your community in order to find yourself and who you are yeah. and to learn to tune mm. into yourself, but then you need to find a way to connect with the community. And I feel that's mm. kind of where we are today, you know, we're talking mm. about, you know, filter bubbles and people getting stuck in mm. tribal conflicts, you know, but everyone yeah. is kind of looking for their in-group, you know, like um, mm. who are my kind of people, who are my tribe, you know, who are the people I connect with and who share mm. my way of thinking. And that. Uh, um, so like, uh, I think that's just a part of human development. And it's also like, you know, mm. like you're, you're not just an, a uh, person who is confined to your own body and your thoughts, but mm. part of your brain is also, uh, extroverted in the sense uh, that also means it's also mm. concerned with the outer world and yeah. everything that happens around you and all the people in your life and so on. And, mm. uh, you can't uh, individuate only by focusing on the internal part of what am I, but also exactly. who am I in the world? Mm. Exactly. I really love that. And it's like, you know, like another thing that I have my home, especially in the second edition, is like we are all introverted and extroverted. You shouldn't identify as an introvert. You shouldn't identify as an extrovert. You know, you should see, you should look for integration. You know, the entire purpose is integration and you can't be, <laughs> you can't be truly yourself if you're only existing in half of yourself. Whether you like it or not, you know, all your view you know, <laughs> introverts out there, you are half extroverted. <laughs> and until you bring that side of you, until you reconcile that side of yourself, the shadow, if you will, or the, you know, the, the counter ego, until you bring this all into yourself and integrate all aspects of yourself, you may not actually feel whole um, in a way that you'd like to. So Indeed. yeah, that's what I like to kind of stress, just as you say, Eric, just pushing into that kind of that opposing side of your psyche and identifying with the entirety of what it means to be human rather than just the part that feels safer.
Indeed. And I think, you know, like often when people come to typology, it's uh, kind of because they've been a bit burnt out, I think, on society yeah. and fitting in and, you yeah. know, like, and then they're looking for, you know, who am I, you know, and they're starting to finally, you know, set their boundaries and they're starting to speak mm. out, you know, but there is a point, you know, like there's a level to this and how far you can take it. I know El Elaine mm. Aaron and a uh, highly sensitive mm. person, uh, she has this example of, you know, you can uh, kind of escape to a cave where there is no noise, no distractions and nothing that will ever disrupt your focus. And then you'll sit mm -hmm. there in that cave and then you'll start getting frustrated as you hear the dripping noise of water from <laughs> outside and you'll be like, what is this noise? You know, and you're <laughs> not like, yeah, there's, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can never really escape from uh, that part mm -hmm. of yourself and you need to align your inner self with the outer world at some extent mm -hmm. and find a way to uh, create an environment around you that fits and matches with who you are and what you need. So much, so much. And it's like on um, the part of the, um, the aspects of CPT that distinguishes it from other systems in many ways is the attitudes, the idea that kind of like for as long as you are acting upon one thing, you are simultaneously observing another thing. In order to observe one thing, you must act in some way and upon another thing. So that means if you're observing external reality, which is an introverted cognition, is one which observes um, rather than interacts with external reality predominantly, then you are automatically kind of like transfiguring the self. You are automatically recalibrating the self. You are changing the inside. So that means the attitude of convergence is shifted towards, you know, the internal state. You know, if your next event is more not about being kind of like sociable or not sociable or preferring a long time or not preferring a long time, it means much more that kind of your primary state of interaction, convergence, is interaction with external reality. And you do so by observing what you want, what you consider to be logical, for example. And that means, you know, you're observing the internal world in order to act on the outside world. And the great thing about the attitudes is, again, it's just it's so fluid. Like I remember some people misinterpreting what I was saying, like um, back in the early days of CPT. So I was saying, oh, no, no, attitudes aren't fixed. I'm like, I oh, know, definitely attitudes are not fixed. <laughs> course not because then introverts will just be staring all the time they'll never be saying anything <laughs> extroverts will just kind of like be acting upon their own desires and be unable to compromise or unable to kind of intake new information or ha have any kind of original opinion no attitudes are totally fluid but it's just again just like cognitive functions cognitive type itself it's just a predisposition and but then kind of like recognizing that and saying like oh, okay my innate predisposition is more to observe external reality than interact with it how can i mix that up a bit now that I know that, maybe I should, should start interacting a little bit more, but just come up from a place of kind of healthy kind of like self-acceptance and self-love rather than trying to force yourself into something that you're not, because that's the counter side of fluidity. Like if you start saying like, oh, well, we're all fluid. We don't need to be beholden to type. Then you might potentially enter an unhealthy mindset, of kind of like self-hate or self-mutilation, for example, where sort of like you say, well, I can be anything. And that means if I'm not using all the kind of the functions right here, right now, I'm a bad person and I'm less than, you know, I'm meant to be. So it's just like, I've realized, like, especially through doing the type coaching process, an important lesson I've learned is um, just really, really, just for as long as you're advocating like development and fluidity, really advocate self-love as well. Because it's, it, it can, because as soon as it turns into some sort of like, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough then it becomes completely like self-destructive and it's like yeah. counterproductive as yeah. well. But if you do sort of like, I really like who I am right now, but I'm just going to tweak these things. That's nice. And you don't have to be in a rush either. It's kind of why I talk about personal growth instead of personal development, because I just Ooh, want to, I, like I, I just want to mm. see it as, you know, like you're kind of like coming to accept who you are and nurture yourself and uh, give yourself mm. the things you need in order to thrive and to, yeah, accept yourself. You know, I think the goal when it, exactly. when it comes to, you know, cognitive de function, development and mm. understanding these things is just learning to accept each individual part of yourself and understanding all mm. that all of these functions exist within you and all have a unique role. There is no mm. hierarchy. It's not uh, you don't uh, have four functions only or two functions only you have all <laughs> functions and you need all these mm -hmm. things to different extents in different ways and that all serve mm -hmm. different roles in you so understanding each yeah. role and purpose of each function yeah yeah exactly now exactly. there was actually a thing i would like mm -hmm. to argue with you in the book uh, and Let's that's uh, uh yeah one thing you do in your book and uh, mm. that's uh, uh kind of repositioning the tertiary and the auxiliary mm. function uh, and mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. putting them on an equal term but still not really you're kind of mm. also moving to the direction that the tertiary is almost more important than the auxiliary uh, <laughs> and uh mm. the, this vis visible in your type code where you, for example you called INFJ mm -hmm. 
an INTF type mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's just mm -hmm. you're putting the thinking uh, almost above uh, the feeling. Ah, and uh, you're okay. yeah. kind of making yeah. that argument. And I'm wondering, like, what uh, what is what is your view on that? Can an INFJ have stronger extroverted feeling than introverted thinking? Is that possible? Ah, okay, cool. So this is where it gets like, and this is where it's like, it's difficult to communicate CPT without like overloading people with the like the more complex sides of it. Um, absolutely not. Like um, in terms of like um, um, sorry, in terms of like the the positioning and in terms of the rank order, the entire emphasis of CPT like in upon like the kind of map is like flattening out like in a more lateral kind of like perspective. Like the I N T, for example, the type code means it's I N and then the T is after the N, for example, and then the hyphen means the extroverted side, that feeling side comes first. But it's totally like um, you could totally read it as kind of like well if it's preferential that means introverted intuition then introverted thinking and then extroverted feelings preferred but it's not necessarily how it works at all like even in my case as a convergent subtype like introverted thinking for example within an infj it is auxiliary like it's auxiliary to um the introverted intuition so it's under the young's own kind of premise that the judging function will always be operating alongside the perceiving function and then it's kind of like the how to say it the kind of the logical kind of inference that well if you are perceiving information in a certain direction well it makes sense you're going to be judging that information too because that's the entire point of the irrational versus irrational thing you can't be rational or irrational you're both at the same time so i mean there's always going to be those two functions working in unison but that just means they're a kind of function pairing and that's why that's the true auxiliary. It's not because it's kind of like it's stronger than extroverted feeling. It's actually not because it's a volitional function. Um, oh, that's another part I added to the book because I realized, oh, I really need to distinguish between compulsive functions and volitional functions. Because yeah, absolutely, extroverted feeling is compulsive. And that means technically, if you're doing the rank order functions, introverted intuition and then extroverted feeling, but that introverted intuition within the nine of J it's going to be imbued with introverted thinking because rather than kind of like using introverted feeling as its primary kind of focal point of judgment, it's using introverted thinking as a primary focal point of judgment, which is why it's performing an auxiliary role. Whereas if you say kind of like the second strongest function is auxiliary to the dominant, my TI kind of just like gets all up in arms and stuff because that's just not, it conflicts with the definition of what it means to be auxiliary. Like it's taking the kind of the dominant function out of it. It's counterbalancing. It's performing a very important role and saying, wait a minute, what about that? The person's feelings over there, you know? Um, so it's like, it's much more about getting into the kind of the hard semantics of the whole thing and yeah. saying like, well, yeah, exactly. The NI will be assisted by TI and the FE is going to be assisted by SE, vice versa. But the FE is compulsive and that means, yeah, it will be technically stronger and more magnetic. And that means the NITI would have to really, like, um, prioritize extroverted feeling information over extroverted thinking information in its own internal codification. But ultimately, the reason I call things auxiliary and it's positive the two auxiliary is not to say that MBTI got it wrong, the second function is actually TI. It's much more to say that no, no, introverted intuition is being assisted by, by TI, but because TI is volitional, introverted intuition is sometimes going to be like dipping in between introverted feeling and introverted thinking but with a kind of a TI access point, essentially. And that's where it gets kind of like mad complicated. But it's yeah. totally like on a surface level, you can totally say like, oh yeah, how he's trying to argue about thinking stronger than an INFJ. And every, every INFJ prefers introverted thinking or extroverted feeling. It's like, I know that isn't the case. <laughs> That's it as well. Like I want to also clarify to the viewers a little bit. Uh, so basically what Harry has been saying is that he's moving from a hierarchy to a map. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, you could say every function could be placed in a certain place. You can correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm just going to try mm -hmm. to explain it a little bit for people. Cool. And that's uh, uh, you're putting the tertiary as uh, the convergent auxiliary and mm -hmm. you're putting the auxiliary as the divergent auxiliary in the sense. So that's mm -hmm. uh, kind of the distinction you're making. You're uh, putting and uh, saying uh, that the auxiliary function is uh, the authority and the tertiary function is uh, the agency function, essentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'll say what I do agree with about this, and I, I must say I, I do agree with this point, and that's that when you engage in the divergent functions, like extroverted feeling and extroverted sensing, those are functions that are outside your natural attitude. So if you are, say, an introvert, uh, uh, in the case of an INFJ, uh, then doing extroverted things is going outside of your comfort zone. And so when you do that, you tend to do so more cautiously. And that's when mm. an INFJ will engage in extroverted feeling. They'll typically mm. 
actually mm -hmm. do so uh, with uh, uh, like desire to not push on or uh, tip on anybody's toes or to mm -hmm. do something or say something stupid. So they are very much like that kind of person that goes into extrovert feeling and really does value it. And it's an authority. I, I like the word authority. Mm -hmm. I like calling it a mentor. I like calling it like it's a guiding, mm -hmm. supervising, you know, like role in a yeah. sense. It's telling you like uh, you should be doing this. You should say mm -hmm. that. You should try to do it that way. And then mm -hmm. I tend to see introverted thinking then uh, the mm -hmm. uh, convergent auxiliary in your terms I tend to call uh, the tool and you say it's agency mm, and I yeah. see mm, some similarities exactly. there and how I see it is often uh, that's kind of what you do uh, because you can do that confidently it's uh, like it's an introverted function it's easy to use and access uh, and it's but it, you, mm. you kind of regard it as a tool because what I'm seeing is and I, this might be something you might disagree with is that mm. typically we don't really value uh, this part of ourselves it's more about that it's kind of like an ego boost to engage in this kind of function mm. because yeah uh mm. you, it's very easy and it's something people will usually prize you on and will say oh you're really good at this and you you have seem to have a talent and an aptitude for this but it's mm. uh you actually you're often just doing it in order to please a tribe or in order to kind of fit it and use it to benefit the social hierarchies around you or to uh create something that is of value for the community or the tribe in the example of an infj how do you mm. see about that yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, like in many ways, that does correlate with CPT because I regard the convergent auxiliary as hyperconvergent, and that's why, for example, like <laughs> the tertiary function within other systems, for example, is known to be like a little bit hard to observe but easy to act upon. Um, so that means that correlates with the attitude to the CPT. It's like it's very easy to, for me to come up with kind of like a visual frameworks and perceptives and all of that kind of that TI like theorizing um, stuff, but it's actually harder for me it's more of a challenge for me to actually observe those frameworks you know and render them static without changing them because the attitude is always like i need now that i'm seeing it i need to interact with it i need to kind of reinvent it i need to bring it up again from the ground up like an ENF, entp for example naturally very gifted in kind of like maneuvering around and adapting to the external social atmosphere but sometimes they can sort of trip themselves up in a sense that they're not looking at the social parameters they're trying to push against them all the time you know that's the primary area of convergence so they won't necessarily realize they're actually going too far maybe are stepping past the boundary because they're not putting as much emphasis upon observation as they are um, interaction so in many ways yeah absolutely on the same page there um, in many ways like um Volitional functions in general, like, you know, if you start pushing into TI and kind of like bringing it into more than just a sort of assisted role as an INFJ, you can, you have to train with any volitional, with any dip function, you need to train the ability to pace yourself. So, I mean, there is a capacity for, I mean, I hear something that ETPs report all the time, it's like they give people all of their emotional energy. And that means they're burned out after it because they just put everything into this thing called like social interaction. In the same way, like if I'm going into TI, I'm going in hard. Like I'm putting all of my energy into kind of like this massive meta theorizing kind of process over the space of an hour, maybe. And I'm like, I've had, a, I've had enough of this. I'm not doing it anymore. And then it'll be just, just an auxiliary kind of assistive function while it's kind of recharging in that way. So yeah, there's like, I think in many ways, that's the reason why it's known for kind of like being intense and like, mm. you know, that tool, like function, for example, because we really feel ourselves use it when we do, and we tend to go really hard into it, much harder than we would in our respective kind of like dominant orientation or our authority orientation, for example. And I think yeah. it's the intensity, but you can learn to pace it. And I've learned to pace my TI over time. And now it doesn't feel like so much of a tool anymore. It feels like my dominant pairing has become more kind of balanced. There's not more, more of a balance between the experiential NI emphasis and the rational TI emphasis now. And I'm having an easier time kind of observing my TI frameworks without having to kind of reinvent them um, as well. So yeah, it can definitely be trained, but it's just not innately a paced function. It's very innately a very intense function. So yeah, I think we're pretty much on the same page in that regard, but that's the CPT side of it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, mm. Yeah, that's uh, you mentioned, for example, you're also one uh, of the other uh, systems to talk about subtypes. I've also been very interested in uh -huh. studying subtypes for a long time. And for example, you talk about a little bit archetypes, you talk about how the, uh, mm. there's a convergent archetype or a subtype in a sense, uh, which is uh -huh. more intense in a sense. Uh, uh, and then you say that there is a divergent type that is a little bit more balanced, you almost say, yeah. uh, but yeah. perhaps a little less uh, interesting. I, uh, kind of, <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> argument you're making uh but uh, in that sense you're kind of uh showing that there's uh different 
directions you can take in their growth oh, yeah. uh, and their cognitive development path and that's you can choose to uh hone in on uh your mm -hmm. dominant and your tertiary well uh, converting to auxiliary in this case um mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, or you can choose to if you prefer to uh, focus on your authority function and that means you know like mm. uh, 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 going and uh, making more of an effort uh, to uh, like live under like uh, society's values and to kind of yeah. uh, com uh, converge with reality and like the outer world and to become more rounded and balanced mm. so is mm. any of these paths better than the other <laughs> uh, what I kind of like to try and stress as much as possible is like you might go down that path, like especially at the end of adolescence, where you might go down the, you know, the authority path, or you might go down the agency path. Like, you know, it's, in many ways, it's kind of like I need to blend in versus I need to be a complete individual. Um, and ultimately, though, like that's only half the journey. Like it, it's like in many ways, it's perfectly natural and maybe almost inevitable to kind of to go down one of those paths over the other one. But then, like ultimately, what would happen is like if you get to me, like maybe. How was how many years ago? I don't know, like a few years ago, let's say six years ago, for the sake of argument. Then I was like, okay, I've done all of this conversion kind of like work. I've really, really integrated my TI. I've really kind of like blended that dominant pairing together. I've really just really found my individuality and I found a way to kind of like be happy with myself and like not without feeling the need to conform. I've really subdued the authority function. I've really subdued any kind of underlying social anxiety that stemmed from that for example i'm happy to stand out now and i don't feel like it's a bad thing anymore to stand out and do my own thing but then from that point i was like okay well that's like what about that guy <laughs> so what about like what about all of those social parameters what about the expectations of other people maybe it's nice to embrace effort maybe it's not your enemy maybe it's your friend for mm -hmm. example and then when I start seeing extra about feelings and friends, I was like, and now I can communicate these frameworks to people. And now I can have a conversation with people. Now I can actually be informed by other people and I can inform them. It's like a handshake. So it's like, okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, you know, so it's like, as soon as I embrace that kind of side of things, the more authority um, style journey, then I went down the path of kind of like being able to kind of like form networks, for example, and kind of actually exert influence over the external reality and allow external reality to exert influence over me as well because if you cling too much to the convergent side of things you're just in your own little bubble and you yeah. can feel kind of like i am able to be in a bubble and i can be empowering because then you kind of be a distinct entity but ultimately you need to also integrate and again coming back to that hero's journey exactly like i mentioned i was reading something from your book about infjs and it kind of made me laugh because uh, you were talking about how infjs can have a tendency towards arrogance so that's kind of what i'm seeing here in your explanation that you kind of you you kind of see your six year ago old self as a little bit arrogant like you know, yeah like i figured everything out and you yeah, go even exactly. further you say that infjs have a tendency to talk about and have an opinion about everything even things they have no clue about so yeah uh, <laughs> uh, but nowadays yeah. Uh, what i'm seeing is uh, uh you're starting to uh like let go of that a bit and that's also something that i'm seeing that is very important uh mm -hmm. you know in cognitive development i was reading iron from carl jung uh, in december mm -hmm. and uh, that was a really impactful book for me and like one of the thoughts that i had when i was reading this was you know one of the things i'm realizing is it's so important to kind of surrender yourself and surrender control over things that you have no control over like you mm -hmm. have no control over the external world you can't control other people or uh their response or what's going to happen to you yeah. uh and uh, yeah. you have to uh kind of enjoy and accept it for what it is and uh, then it becomes a lot easier to connect with the outer world because you're no longer trying to move rocks around and getting frustrated yeah. because nothing is that people are not being the way you want them to be or uh life is not exactly. giving you the things you wanted to do like uh, you're learning like uh, to focus on your own role and your own purpose while also accepting you know the impact the world can have on you Exactly. That's beautiful. And it's like, in some ways, it's like um, some, something of a simplistic analogy, but it kind of like pictures me like imagining maybe kind of like a, a fish in a stream of water or maybe kind of like in an underground stream. So it's like, you know, it's surrounded by rock and it's sort of like, you know, it's like on the one hand, you have a fish who really wants to go the other way, <laughs> just pushing against the rock rather than being carried by the stream. And then the actual fish who does allow themselves to be carried by the stream, they actually realize the stream meanders and then actually brings them to the other side of the rock for example, and just allowing life to carry you in that kind of way. And, you know, we're getting into like Taoism and stuff now. Like there's like, there's a lot of beauty in that. And sometimes, you know, it's important to push and other times um, the, last, the last thing you should ever be doing. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. Mm.
Now, I wanted to get into uh, some uh, more spicy things a little bit. And that's, okay. uh, <laughs> that's, that's uh, yes. Uh, uh, so yeah. what I'm curious about is what is your opinion on other systems, uh, say Ooh. objective personality and others? <laughs> like, I know that you're very modest and I see that in your book, like you're constantly saying, I'm not trying to uh, like claim that my system is better than any other. Mm. I'm just trying to provide mm. an alternative model that can have its own mm. use, you know, but uh, mm. what would you say are your advantages? Just over, uh, 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 for example, the objective personalities model. Mm. Well, I guess like um, a primary one would be kind of like the emphasis upon holistic kind of growth. It's really not saying that kind of like this is your savior and this is your demon, for example. And you know, you can definitely make a more nuanced case for why it might be the case, for example. But it's just something I don't really consistently see. Like, um, and it depends upon the context. So like you could take a kind of an attitude role to say it's like in this specific context of my life, or maybe within this year of my life while I'm doing a new job or something, you can say this kind of dominant pairing and this attitude is more my savior, for example. Like maybe I really need to go into my NETE, for example, in order to kind of, you know, adopt this kind of this resource management position that I would be doing in this hypothetical universe. Um, or maybe kind of like, this really is not the time for SEFE. Now it's time to get the gloves on and you know go to war, you know, and there's a time for that too. And maybe in those cases, like if there'll be a more antagonistic relationship with SEFE. Or you can argue kind of like if I'm in a convergent subtype, maybe SEFE, for as long as I'm in that position, is going to be more like anxiety triggering, for example. Mm. Um, and maybe that's but that's not a good thing. You don't want any function to be anxiety triggering. Um, so it's like there are many different nuanced ways you can argue sometimes we have something which is more demonic and sometimes it's more savior for example i just i think more than kind of like disagreeing with that kind of like on the face value i'd simply say it depends and i think that'll be my biggest kind of like opposition to maybe objective personality i operate from the it depends um side of the coin and the it depends side of the coin sort of says it depends upon the context yeah, okay, maybe you have, for example, this potential um, particular like animal preference. Maybe I'm asleep first, for example, with NLP in this current situation. I don't think I was in 2020. <laughs> I was not 20, and I was not asleep first in 2020. So it's like, it just depends upon my own like situation. So it's like, yeah, you can kind of like keep dividing type and, you know, until you have 300 plus types. But as soon as you do so, there's less room for maneuver within those types. Yeah. And so that means like, unless you allow that system to allow people to move between types for example the system would be kind of contradicted by the natural fluidity of the human mind yeah that's probably my biggest yeah go ahead. <laughs> indeed i would say actually uh, that's the same realization i came to because uh, yeah. in the, the the objective personality system has about 512 types and uh, <laughs> the the thing they are doing is every time they notice a small difference between two people they come up with a new coin to explain that difference and uh, that's how mm. it started expanding and became so mm. big but then what i'm seeing what i'm th noticing that they are missing is uh, they're not knowing which of these traits are variable and which ones are fixed and or more permanent and so mm. it's uh, for example they brought about you know the jumpers you know so they say okay there yeah. are enfps mm -hmm. that have strong extroverted thinking and extroverted intuition and then there are enfps that have strong extroverted intuition and introverted feeling and those are mm. distinct different types but what i'm seeing is rather these are variable and that means mm. uh, they can change over time and so you might be a person that has uh, uh, a stronger um, extrovert thinking and often I'd argue that's not necessarily always healthy and all mm. that's what I'm also seeing as yeah. their, their, yeah. their theory is not necessarily a theory of growth or development and they are mm. honest about this as well they are not offering yeah. growth advice they're not telling people how to develop the functions they're just explaining mm. these is, are the differences that we're seeing yeah, exactly. It's a very, very hard empirical kind of system Indeed. in that way. And it's not about kind of the underlying rational framework of like all the theoretical kind of side of things as much as it's simply, well, this is what we're saying. Therefore, that is similar to that. And that means that goes over there. And that is similar to that. And I mean, that, that goes over there. And when they overlap, maybe things get a bit confusing. And when one moves over to the other side, things get confusing um, mm. as well. So it's like a very important for any kind of system like that to really make sure that those variables are fixed, because as soon as they're fluid, then the system itself needs to be rational. You need to create a theoretical explanation and a theoretical basis for this kind of empirical observation. You need to have a system to fit it within rather than relying upon what you're trying to fit within to be the system in the first place. <laughs> so it's kind of like my TI versus TE argument. And I, and I just like to say it's both. I don't consider CPT a yeah. TI framework. It's just 
I do take the TI stuff first, the introverted thinking frameworks first, because then I can say, okay, now I have this massive sphere where everyone can move around. Now let's start getting data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what I like to like think about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what I'm seeing as well in your book. Like one thing you mm -hmm. really developed in the new version from the first version is like I read all of your uh, personality type descriptions, uh, and the mm -hmm. in the past they were a lot more abstract. That meant uh, yeah. when I was reading these <laughs> things, I was like half the time I was like, what am I reading right now? <laughs> but, yeah. uh, this is my honest, like opinion yeah. about it but totally, now totally. uh now mm. that i'm seeing it is you're starting to bring it more real and perhaps uh your coaching mm. sessions have had an impact on this because i know so, so helpful yeah yeah i know you've been running like a really big coaching uh, uh program mm. and uh, you've been helping a lot of people and uh finding mm. their type and you're doing like really in-depth mm. sessions with people like can you tell me a little yeah. about your coaching program and how that's oh yeah absolutely you? And it's like it's been so invaluable because the thing is like cpt was like it was still formed upon like case studies i did with people and it's, but it was all typing it's just typing 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 you were this you were that you were that and i mean theoretically you're probably that too but it's all theoretical because you don't see the person in the real life you don't see them move around that's where the coaching has been so useful for the data side of things because it's not a typing process you're not sort of putting someone in this kind of like this isolated context and then saying, because I'm observing you doing this in this isolated context, that means you are going to do this across all the other contexts of your life. No. <laughs> Whereas like, if you get to the coaching thing, like what happens essentially is, depending upon whether they go the, the two session route or the three session route, or some people like make it recurring. But either way, like there has to be a part of it dedicated to framing the, the context of a person's life. Mm. I do that to an extent my type of service because I can't type someone about this level of context and history. Um, but with coaching, I push that further and say, like, what are all of the variables of your life? How do you change in according to different aspects of your life? Where the different sides of you come out in different aspects of your life? And where are there opportunities to allow other sides of you to come out in sides of your life that do not currently allow for it, for example? So in many ways, it's kind of like rather than sort of me saying to develop your introverted sensing, you need to start doing this and you need to dedicate an hour of the, every day to doing this, for example. That's unsustainable. You need to find a way to kind of to see what a person's life is currently like, and then just say, how can we add more of this function to what you're already doing, to what is already meaningful to you? And yeah, maybe if this function really needs to be brought up, maybe we'll add something like a little exercise of you to do every day, but only if we feel like it's synergistic with the rest of your life. Because the most important thing of any kind of coaching process is to sort of give people things that they can take away with them and continue doing. You know, rather than sort of like these rote exercises that sort of like are more suited to maybe people with a more extrovert thinking preference. Like maybe they'll be happy, maybe they'll get structure from that. But like most people, myself included, they were not gonna, they're not gonna sustain all of these ways to develop certain cognitive functions if it doesn't, if it's not relevant, if it's only for the sake of developing a cognitive function. So like in many ways, the central axiom of the coaching service is saying. You could benefit from these kind of functions already. We don't need to add in things that facilitate these kind of functions. It's already there. Everything about your life, no matter how simple it is, has already got room for all of the kind of functions within it. And then we just identify things, these things and then say, we can add that, we can add that. And the beautiful thing about this process is that so it makes people much more organic and it shows and it brings to light the fluidity of their cognition as well it brings to light how they change certain, according to certain contexts so that means even from a data gathering perspective that gives me more of this information and that gives me you know that that, that did feed into the book and saying like yeah there's more human aspects to this now i'm actually seeing these things grounded i'm seeing these fluid aspects grounded in reality in a way that i wouldn't necessarily in a do you do this do you do that kind of questionnaire <laughs> That's also a little bit kind of my challenge for you in a sense, because uh, mm -hmm. I'm seeing that you uh, really used uh, and benefited from those experiences. And I, I see and that your descriptions mm -hmm. are becoming uh, like more and more real. Now, what I'm mm -hmm. wondering is, do you think it would be mm -hmm. possible for you also to uh, uh, reference the, these experiences and these uh, like situations mm -hmm. and those lessons from coaching also uh, in your book to give more examples and more cool. like a clear like image to mm -hmm. um, how things will be? And so my <laughs> final question is like, uh, is yeah. there going to be a third edition? And so what will the third edition <laughs> expand on? I absolutely love that. I think what I'm going to be doing is kind of like keeping the first book 
kind of like the more kind of like the abstract theoretical. This is what CPT is, and sort of like now it's more grounded and stuff, but ultimately that isn't the point. The point of the second book is to be more hard scientific and empirical. So that means, you know, the first book's rational, second book's empirical. And that's more the kind of the, the side of things that I'm taking. So that means I'm saying this is what it looks like in the brain, for example. This is what it looks like in real life. I've already kind of written multiple scenarios in the work that I have done on the second book in order to demonstrate this is tangibly what these kind of processes look like. But also the, the rational side of it says, but look how this opposing set of cognitive processes arrives at the same conclusion. And that's the important part of kind of an, any empirical typology. You can't judge a cognition by the conclusion that it comes to. You can't judge the cognition by the behavior alone because multiple different networks can lead to the same output in many ways, or an output that seems comparable enough to put it in the same box. And that's maybe like where, again, I might disagree with a more purely empirical system. So it's like, so yes, um, <laughs> is my answer to you. I'm going, I am already integrating more examples and stuff. Um, you know, my FE is just like so triggered in a sense of kind of like, I'll never want to be kind of referring to clients. You know, I'm always like hard respecting privacy and confidentiality and less explicitly kind of indicated yeah. by the client. Um, but absolutely. And another thing that I've got in the pipeline is kind of like bringing people on the channel to kind of like to be interviewed, you know, like past clients, potentially people I know in real life that I kind of like to give things more of a human face and establish a greater sense of community now that I'm getting the ball rolling on channel growth once again. And again, that gives people relevance, that gives people something solid because like I know in like my recent videos, it's been at the end of a very long journey of kind of like really trying to dedicate the YouTube channel to kind of theoretical elaboration. This is the system. And now I feel like I've expressed all of these systematic kind of axioms. I've, now that I've expressed what the system is fundamentally and what it is not, more importantly, I'm in a position now where I can comfortably start adding in like all of the good SE stuff, all of the examples, all of the kind of like the kind of like the more collaborative kind of side of things, bringing in actual real people onto the channel so people can actually see them getting into that kind of that more empirical um, zone now. But I wouldn't say I was comfortable to do that like even a few months ago because I just needed to make sure all of this foundation is laid. And now the foundation's laid. Yes. But if you asked me that a few months ago, I'd be like, no, it's not ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. So you're doing it also in phases and that you're taking the time to make sure that each one is done correctly. That's exactly. also uh, my uh, goal at this time. It's really just mm. a uh, flow, flow, flow. Like uh, uh, for mm, me, like yeah. when I'm thinking about uh, as uh, just constantly now, uh, is the hero's journey, uh, individuation, mm self-transcendence you know like those are the questions that i'm constantly asking myself what is the self you know what is inner experience mm. what there, where does meaning and value come from yeah. you know so uh when i'm making every video now and when i'm writing on personal topia my blog and uh mm -hmm. when i'm connecting with people it's now that's the thing i want to talk about all the time you know how do you develop the functions yes. how do you connect with them how do you build yes. a deeper experience to the self exactly and how do you get more sense of agency and self-control so it's really truly personal growth uh, 100 percent uh, for me at the moment and that's my that's passion i'm so so happy to hear this and i can definitely see it in what you've been putting out too and like uh yeah it's a cognitive map yeah <laughs> it is map. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes so that's it like we're uh <laughs> you're on a quest to uh end the cognitive function hierarchy the eight function model and to replace it with a map <laughs> And you're exactly. trying to uh, uh, bring about the more uh, big understanding of cognitive fluidity. You're trying to develop, you could say, cognitive flexibility in a sense, so help people like uh, yeah. uh, learn to uh, uh, switch between and to use their different functions, all functions. And mm. uh, you're getting people to see instead of themselves as static people that are only introverted or only intuitive, or uh, to yeah. understand that they have more potential than that. And you're getting people mm. to understand the, that the role in those relationships. That's something I really like to commend you on. Uh, oh, thanks. Mm. I also really like to thank you for yeah, joining me in this discussion today. Mm. And uh, uh, yeah, I must say I had a blast talking to you, and I'm sure the viewers really enjoyed it. So I'm sure uh, you people would really like to see you in the future. And if you'd like to see Harry on the channel again, like leave a comment. And also, don't forget to check out his ebook. I'll leave a link down below in the description in the comments so you can uh, buy the book. And I promise you're going to absolutely enjoy it. And it's going to be absolutely amazing. <laughs> so definitely check it out. Cool. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Eric. Words? It's been a <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just been fantastic talking to you. I mean, like definitely on the same page about so much of this. And it is absolutely refreshing 
to be able to do that and to talk to like a YouTube channel here's who is like also invested in this growth side of things also like you know pushing the limit of what what this all means and how can we use it in a positive way rather than one which restricts us and causes unnecessary discrimination when it needn't exist in the first place too and how can we just use this from the hero's journey individuation standpoint um towards kind of like a healthier um self and a healthier world <laughs> as a whole so yeah this has been great i've really enjoyed talking to you and thank you to everyone for watching thank you so much